just leave and behold, police, provincial office, Talaboom Police Station. So I had to come in here and file another case yet again. Uh, I just I just don't understand when this stuff is going to end. It's really getting old. Really, really getting old. All right, I'm on my way out of town here. I'm on the back road. Oh, I just saw a brand new Toyota Corolla. Holy cow, is that a big car for this area? Beautiful looking. Wonder how much those cost. Sorry, I got the air on here. I hope that doesn't hurt the sound. It's just been an hour in the police station. Man, they got a full house today. <laughs> Their cell, they've only got, I think it's one cell split in two. And uh, <laughs> it was just almost standing room only. I, should, I guess I should have, I should have asked if I could bring the camera in and talk to the guys. I never even thought about it at the time, but I even had my camera with me. But. I went to the, the prison in the Taliban area one time. I saw some kites flying and uh, it was the windy season and Shannon always always wanted a kite. So I stopped in to, or actually I knocked on the big doors, big 10 foot metal doors, just knocked on the doors and uh, I guess it was a guard came out and uh, I asked him about the kites flying. He said, come on in <laughs> and then clunk, you know, slammed the door behind me. And uh, someone went over and got the deputy uh, warden. And then the warden uh, walked around with me and showed me everything and showed me the cells and, and the inmates. And the guys that were flying the kites, they were uh, trustees. They were allowed to roam around in the grounds with not being in the cages, which is pretty nice for them. And they were the ones that were flying the kites and had them bring them down and I can't remember they wanted some ridiculous amount for the kite but I think I got it for like I think I gave them 250 pesos for it or something like that. it was just a bamboo frame with tissue paper glued all over it and pasted with tissue for all the holes they had in it and stuff and then I drove it home on my motorcycle and I, I almost destroyed it driving home in the motorcycle just from the wind but uh, we Shannon redid it all and uh, retissued it all I think it was, she's about six years old something like that and it flew real nice. It was, it was huge, probably at least four foot across. There's Mercury Drug. That's the most popular drugstore as far as name brand medication and stuff goes. I personally enjoy the generic store. I'm, I'm hoping all the stuff and it is real. As far as I know, I've never had an issue with anything, but uh, you never know here what you're dealing with. <clears throat> I saw an article, uh, a friend of ours, in fact, our, our, our wonderful friend Danielle sent me an article, <clears throat> a link to an article on yellow rice. I think I think the article. I didn't read the whole article yet, but the article said that I believe it was approved here in the Philippines for sale. And then I mentioned it to a, my other friend, to my good friend Don, and Don knew all about the yellow rice. He said it's been been growing in America for more than 20 years, and they can't get it past the FDA to sell it. So they're selling in other countries. And the yellow, what the yellow rice is, is it's, it's genetically modified. What's that GMO or whatever they call it? And it produces carotene like a carrot. So it, it, as it metabolizes in your body, it releases vitamin A for you. And in a place like this, vitamin A to the kids wouldn't be a bad thing. But the bad thing, the, the thing that I saw, or that instantly, instantly clicked into my head, was uh, two things. First, if it's special rice, 
it'll probably be more expensive. So the people that need it won't be able to afford it anyway. And number two is all of a sudden you're gonna start seeing yellow rice in all the street stores and what it'll be. And I'm not saying that they will do it, but maybe the people that they, they buy their rice from will be just dying the rice yellow and then selling it for premium price. And this is what clicked in my head. I don't, I don't, whether that would happen or not, I don't know. Could that happen? Very easily. Uh, we've seen some pretty bad things coming from uh, China over here. Uh, in fact, it wasn't long after Shannon was born, and again, the only reason I knew about this is because we were buying formula milk for Shannon, and I was always trying to buy the best I could buy, which was a, a, a Nestle's brand, the Nestle's Gold or whatever it was, and uh, it was pretty expensive, but I bought the cheaper stuff and the really cheap stuff, and we tried it, and it was just, it was almost like spoiled milk when you add water to it. So we went with the, the better quality stuff, and uh, you know, we had to adjust our budget for that, you know, totally, but it was well worth it because, you know, you wanna, want the best for your kid you can get. And, but one, my, my point is baby food was, um, I get so sidetracked, my brain just rattles on. The, from China, I'm not saying it was the Chinese, it came from China, they were adding Melamar to baby foods, powdered baby milk foods, and Melamar powder is the powder that they make, like the Melamar dishware, you know, plates and, and bowls and stuff. They were adding that to the baby food, and not just a couple teaspoons, they were, it was like, I'm gonna say it was like 10% or more of that, and it, it, it couldn't even have been, it couldn't even have been for a cost thing to because it's cheaper than milk you know how could how could a plastic product be cheaper than powdered milk to put in a thing I think it was for to damage people to hurt kids possibly kill kids and at the very at the very least make them sick so people had to take care of them you know like the, if you think about something like that uh, a wounded a wounded person is actually more of a strain on a, a group than a death is. Death is emotional, but it's over in a second. A wounding is also emotional, and not near as emotional, but it's something that you have to take care of over a longer period of time, and it's a severe wound, you take care of it a long, long time, and you wind up putting a lot of your energies into that rather than doing whatever you were doing to whoever was against you. They used to do that in Vietnam. What were they called, Pun punji sticks, something like that? The bamboo sharpened sticks and holes. And then they would take the sticks and they would roll them around in horse manure, sharpen them to a razor, put them in horse manure. And then when an American soldier would step in the hole, he would get you know skewered, poked by the bamboo stick would go through his boot and he would get an instant infection and say they were way out somewhere on maneuvers uh, for something like that and they're in the jungle they couldn't evacuate someone with a helicopter or anything like that so they had to carry that man if he couldn't walk which is a great possibility because of the severity of the infection would be so that would actually put more of a strain on the unit because at least two guys had to carry them all the time, keep switching on and off, taking their energy and their uh, firepower away from them. Not really so much, they could just drop the guy in the stretcher and grab their gun and start shooting. But it was just a strain on everybody. And it usually didn't happen to one guy, it usually happened to a couple, two or three guys out in a mission. And uh, it would be very uh, debilitating for the squad. That's the word I was looking for, for the squad. 
this guerrilla warfare type stuff. Actually quite smart. But and if you guys ever get a chance to watch National Geographic's Vietnam War through the eyes of the other side or whatever it's called and it's all all photographs and movies and stuff from North Korean not North Korean North Vietnamese I'm sorry I don't know if I say Korean War Vietnam War the other side of the Vietnam War <laughs> sorry for that and it's all photographs and videos from Vietnamese photographers and uh, some of the photographs are pretty interesting it's all black and white or mostly black and white but uh, very interesting and you know real good stuff too but all from a different angle and they're they're obviously they're showing the atrocities that we did to them plus war and plus just general pictures of wherever they were at they took a lot of scenic photos and stuff and very interesting video though I had it on DVD a long time ago but I, I don't know where it's at I, but I started going through the thing I'm sure I could find it but very interesting though I also saw some real interesting footage uh, color footage from the Germans in World War II that was pretty cool too again it was from a totally different angle of what they were filming what was important to them and I saw a lot of stuff from Russia and also Germany black and white movies uh, most of them didn't have any sound but a lot of some of them had sound I think the allied cameras that did most of the filming they had sound in them but I think they were basically hand crank cameras where they didn't have batteries in or anything like that because there wasn't such a thing back then they were portable cameras but they had to run a crank on them while they were filming here's a trivia question for you um, I just had the guy's name and it tipped my tongue <laughs> CBS correspondent Dan something his name was Dan just had it on my tongue. I can't believe I'm, I'm losing, losing my mind, I guess. Whenever I want to pull something out. I even had it in my name in my head just a second. Dan Rather, there you go. Did you know did you know that Dan Rather was the youngest war correspondent in World War II? He lied about his age. He was only 16 or 17 years old. And I remember Walter Cronk. Uh, stuff about Walter Cronkite being there. He he went in on a glider. I think it was near dear near D-Day. He went in on a glider and uh, survived. Uh, it was a bad thing. The glider program. I uh, can't say it was a failure, but it was a big risk for the guys that were on them. Where they have a big a big plane pulling. I don't know how many gliders were pulling five or six gliders behind him I'm not even sure <clears throat> might only been one but I think it was many and they got up over Germany and they they pulled their cords and then they they glided to the ground but there was no <laughs> no runways uh, basically no roads for them to go on to and they were landing in fields and places like that and they landed hard and they were just plywood planes I don't know what the rate was. I'm just guessing like 35 or 40 percent of the, the planes crash and lots and lots of fatalities. I have to watch another video on it and, and get the exact facts. I just I watched so many things over the last 20 years, and they're just all little bits and pieces in my brain. But I don't have the exact details of stuff. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but. A broad awareness, not a not a photographic mind. All right, well, getting close to home here. We're in Bagakai, 
right over there, that place there, that's a, a home shop where they make pottery. They have several uh, spinning wheels, pottery wheels, and a great big uh, walk-in kiln. And you can get anything you want there. You, you ask them what you want, or tell them what you want, and they'll make it for you. Custom things are a little more expensive, but uh, the quality of their stuff's very good, very nice. My friend Pearlie's brother is married to one of the daughters there. But I've had some custom things made for fire, for cooking, uh, rocket stoves and things like that. They don't, they have no idea what you're talking about, but I'd have to draw out patterns of what I wanted made. And uh, the things they made me was, were pretty good. I got a couple clay things for baking. They were nice. There's another pottery place on the way to Ubai, just past the hospital here in Talaboon. And uh, they do some real fancy work, like uh, cooker burners that have two and three uh, fire outlets on them at different heights. I did a video a long time ago about one that had two of them on there, two, or two exits or outlets on them. Uh, very, very nice quality. They also did stuff with a lot of glazing. Most of the stuff you see here is no, no glaze on it at all. It's just fired clay, and it you know, comes out red, terracotta style. <clears throat> but the other place does uh, glazing, and I think they might have like different color glazes or something, because I've seen different, different color fixtures there before, but very nice quality, and, and big, great big vases. You, know, you can buy a four foot vase if you wanted to for you know, water storage, stuff like that. Very interesting. I've gone in there and talked to him before. I watched him make some pots one day. And the guy's real good. I mean, it's your job. I'm sure you're good at it. But always wanted, always wanted a potting wheel. Always thought that'd be a fun hobby. And then there's all kinds of little cottage places on the way. Around there, there's a vein of proper clay. It has a, a real light, almost a silica sand in it. And it's a big vein of it going up through that valley. And every, almost every house in that valley, if they have any side jobs, they make pots. And they don't have kilns, though. What they do is they dig a big hole in the ground, and they line it with grasses and things like that. And then they make a big, huge fire on top of it with a big, giant grass pile. And then they blow air on it and uh, burn it. They might even burn it twice. I'm not even sure about that but it's hot enough that it, it fires the, the clay very nice. The only bad thing is they lose you know, 10 to 20% of the uh, contents because it's such a hot fire all at once. Some things will crack on you, especially if there's any slight moisture in it at all. That's why a lot of times you'll see when I'm driving, you'll see terracotta things stacked on the shoulder of the road. What they're doing out there, they're drying in the sun. They'll dry them in the sun for about a week take them in every night so they don't get moisture on them and then they'll fire them. Uh, most of the stuff those people make are like charcoal cookers and stuff like that. Uh, firewood cookers. Big machine there. I wonder where he's going. Alright, well, I'm home. Please click like and subscribe. You can contact us anytime at blindowloutdoors at gmail.com. Thank you very much and have a great day. I know I am.